all these years later, the track at Marshfield High School still bears the name of its prodigal son. This was his home. This is the track he started on. It was the track that he ended his life on because this is where we had the funeral. Steve Prefontaine is many things now. The rebel, the icon, the near mythical figure in the running world. Steve was special. He's, you know, he's bigger than life. He's a legend. 1975 marked an end to a chapter in the book of Pre. But six years earlier, in Pre's final year in high school, the legend was just starting to be written. At that time, uh, Coos Bay was the world's largest lumber shipping port. It was a logging, longshoring, fishing community. The labor unions were, were strong. We had mills along the bay. And it was, uh, it was kind of a boom time uh, at that time. In Coos Bay, you knew almost everybody in town. And as you can see now, the, the bay is pretty quiet as far as manufacturing is concerned. In spite of the decades-long economic downturn of the area, Coos Bay's workmanlike culture has persisted. If you wanted something, you had to work hard for it. That was the mentality of the, the community, of the kids. And obviously, athletics was huge. A lot of the kids, you know, were, that were competing in athletics in those days were from mill families, uh, fishermen, that sort of thing. So they were rough kids. They're not rough, but hard competing kids. If you wanted to be someone who was noted mm -hmm. around town, you became an athlete. The industries and the area inspired many, including a kid growing up on the corner of 9th Street in Elrod by the name of Steve Prefontaine. That environment, you know, hardworking people, I think, made for stronger people, both physically and mentally. The coaching staff at Marshfield was dominated by World War II vets. They were very goal-oriented. They were very, uh, and of course, they were very strict. That certainly uh, had an influence on his personality, I'm sure, because that, that's just the personality of the town. And it wasn't just the mental environment. The actual physical area of Coos Bay made for a distance runner's dream. We had hills, we had beach, we had the dunes. We, had, we could go up the river and have 80 degrees, or we could run on the coast and have 50 degrees and wind. And we'd have all kinds of conditions to run in, so it was a great place to train. Those things contributed to um, the mentality that he had, that sort of tough mentality. Steve's first two years running track and cross country at Marshfield was met with moderate success. But even by Coos Bay standards, his work ethic was already becoming legendary. It was not, a, you know, a half-hearted effort ever for him. You, even in workouts, we would be running intervals, and he never wanted any of his teammates to finish an interval ahead of him. He had uh, a unique DNA and a unique uh, community DNA that... Uh, caused him to want to be the, the best in the world. And that energy was channeled into excellence with the help of coaches Walt McClure and Phil Persian, with some assistance from the University of Oregon. I would credit Walt McClure as having really set the, the basis for Steve's future achievements. He ran at University of Oregon, and his father went to the Olympics. McClure and uh, Bowerman had a relationship. Maybe Bill Bowerman didn't come to our house, but Bill Dellinger did, and so and they sent some recruits from Oregon to run with Steve. We started doing their workouts. The first time we ever did that, I mean, I got sick. I got physically sick, and I remember Pre was making fun of me because <laughs> I was <laughs> heaving. And after about three or four more three thirties, he was heaving. Walt was talking to Bowerman, and when he realized the kind of talent that Steve was or the potential that Steve had. And he looked at me and he said, you know, if that young man doesn't go on and do great things, I would have been the, uh, the greatest disservice to him. Um, he was concerned about screwing it up, and he didn't screw it up. Part of the Bowerman program involved outlining goals and target times, and Steve had big plans for his senior year. <laughs> He was, of course, 4 and 840, 
and 152 or something, I think. He improved so much between his junior and his senior year. I mean, he went, went from, what, 917 or something in the two mile down to 841. The workouts that we did in winter track, were, it was two mile, mile, and, and, and half mile. And we had a date pace, which is what we could run at that time, and a goal pace. And Priest's goal pace was uh, under the two mile record. Steve had already set the Oregon High School state record for the two mile his junior year. So coming back in his final year of Marshfield, he wanted to prove he was the best in the United States. I think probably his senior year of high school, uh, the mystique uh, was, was happening at that point. When everything really changed was when he set the na national high school two mile record. Mm -hmm. And then the phone rang off the hook. To beat Pre, you had to beat him up here and with your legs, and that's tough to do. He was unbelievably tough mentally. Walt McClure, you know, I think geared his training to, for a shot at the National High School two-mile record. And so there was a lot of buzz around uh, when that was going to happen and where it was going to happen. The day was April 25th, 1969 at Corvallis High School. Everybody's talking, maybe somebody's going to break nine minutes today. And that was the goal. And I think a couple of them did break nine minutes, or they were right there, but they were like 150 yards behind Pre. <laughs> Phil got one arm and I got the other one, and we put them, you know, around our shoulders, and we started to walk him a little ways to until they could catch his breath and, and recover slightly. And then they announced on the, the PA system that he had just broken the national record. And it was like he had all this energy again. The Corvallis coach says, next time you try to set, decide to set a medal, uh, national record at our school, uh, we'll pass. <laughs> Just got all the paperwork in those days that was required. Pre had arrived. He also set the one mile Oregon high school state record at the Coos County meet that same year. With those time milestones out of the way, he turned his focus to making history. Our senior year was the first year you could double at state in the mile and two mile. Before that, you, you could only run one or the other. That was one of our objectives throughout the whole senior year, not only the times, but also, yeah, to be, well, the first kid to ever double the mile and the two mile. The rule change came as a result of an outstanding crop of Oregon runners and also a little bit of a push from Walt McClure. It was never called that, but in reality, it was a Prefontaine ruling. <laughs> McClure was on the state board and he went to the meeting in the middle of the winter and he basically said, guys, I got one that can run all day and all night, <laughs> he can double. And I think he had some backing, obviously he had some backing from Bowerman and from Dillinger. And at the state meet, Pre did it again. I took a bunch of my friends out there and I said, you're gonna, you guys are gonna see something special today. And then none of them had ever heard of him and they couldn't believe it, blew him away. Oh, he's going way too fast. He's, this, he can't take this pace. All those other guys are running right together. They know what they're doing. I said, he, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Steve finished that state meet as the high point man of the event, pacing Pirates track. As we went to the starting line, he was coming back from having finished that race, which was a tough race, competitive race, um, that he'd won. And he said, okay, guys, it's all up to you. Um, and I've, you know, I've thought about that many times over the, the 50 years. Um, since we graduated from high school. Ultimately, the team finished third and Steve graduated into the waiting arms of Oregon and Bill Bowerman. And the rest, as they say, is the stuff of legend. Who's foremost in your mind in Munich? Well, there's a lot of them. There's going to be 12 people in the, in the final event, and if I'm there, there's going to be 12 people that could win. Steve Prefontaine lays at rest on a hill overlooking the water in Coos Bay. His rock in Eugene is a holy place in the runner's world, 
But here he is at peace, in an area surrounded by those who knew him best, when Pre was just a shortening of his last name. He was pretty long before he got to Eugene. Uh, he was just the guy that sat in front of me in, in math. He'd always acknowledge and you know uh, anybody that he knew from high school, whether they were an athlete or just somebody at Marshfield. But he never forgot his roots. He was standing there on the track, and there was a growing line of little kids and young kids junior high and younger, not high schoolers, coming up to him with their little pieces of paper or programs, and he stood there and signed those. Excuse me. That's who he was. 50 years after his final season donning the colors of his hometown high school, it all means something greater. Pre is as much an idea, a mentality, as it is a name. There's definitely, you know, uh, kind of a, a little bit of a weight to the to the job as far as realizing that this is this it's not just your typical track and field head coaching position or or being part of the team. I think that it, uh, you know, from for the coaches and staff, it it kind of makes it a little bit more important. I, I think that we, we take it on, especially, uh, you know, from the head coach, you know, I kind of feel sometimes like I'm, I'm as much of a, of a caretaker, you know, as a coach. But to those in Coos Bay, Pre represents the boy and the man they knew, who ran the track at Marshfield that now bears his name, who walked down 4th Street, where murals of him adorn building walls, and where his words echo and reverberate still. I think Coos Bay is still proud of, you know, I'm going to say their most famous um, son. I think the biggest thing is the example he set to push to do your best that you possibly can for people, you know, for kids to do not only in sports but for the rest of their life. It does something to them uh, and seeing where this humongous legacy came from this little teeny out of the way uh, beautiful place called Coos Bay, Oregon and um, and it, I think it, it makes I think it makes them realize in their heads that yeah I can do this too yeah look at look at what he did I can do this too Steve Prefontaine would be turning 68 this year, and despite the tragic nature of his passing, he continues to inspire, as the rebellious collegian with long flowing hair and a trademark mustache, or the fresh-faced small-town Coos Bay kid leading from the front. Even long departed, his memory, the manifestation of the runner's spirit, is never truly gone. And here, where the Pacific Ocean meets the Douglas firs, and the dunes along with them create the perfect runner's paradise, Pre is home.